So today's webinar is titled The Sustainability Mindset with Isabel Rimanozzi. She well, She's the convener of LEAP, and she is uh, the leader of the prime working group on the sustainability mindset. For those who did not see the original announcement and those listening to the video recording, let me uh, share with you uh, the original announcement for this webinar. Research has been showing over the past decade the profound transformation of individuals who, for a variety of reasons, faced their inner landscape of unsustainability. They experienced the personal breakthrough and expansion in their consciousness that changed how they saw themselves and the world around them. The transformational shift also was the fuel for action, a persistent inside driven motivation that spurred creativity. This transformational process happened not because of the information they had about statistics, data, or benchmark of innovators. The process took place on another level on the being dimension. And yet, what are we educators doing in our classrooms? We are teaching the internal, the, we are teaching the external landscape of sustainability, seeking the latest cases in the news that can spark engagement in our students. We cater to the heads when the most powerful leverage point is in the heart, connected to purpose, to values, to the examination of the anchors of our identity, to who we are in the simplest and most profound way. This webinar will introduce the research that originated the concept of sustainability mindset, the elements that compose it and how it can be developed. Isabel Rimanozzi will share how it is being brought into courses in higher education around the world, and she will share about LEAP, which is Leverage Resources, Expand Awareness, Accelerate Change, and Partner, a network of academics in, 20, in 75 universities in 35 countries, promoting a new mindset anchored in the being. Isabel has made it her life purpose to promote change accelerators, aware of the complex challenges our planet and us in it are facing, she works alongside those who can make an impact on as well. I'll ask folks to mute their lines, please. She developed the sustainability mindset, a concept she researched by studying business leaders who championed corporate arrangements with, an with a positive impact on environment and the community. What inspired the leaders to act in a business as usual? She created LEAP an international cohort of 83 academics from 72 universe, universities on five continents, promoting a holistic sustainability mindset with their students. These professors foster a new paradigm, social action and consciousness. LEAP was officially designated the prime working group on sustainability mindset in June 2015 at the Global Forum of UN Prime in New York. And the members are researching the sustainability mindset in their context and culture, writing papers and presenting it. Uh, conferences. Isabel also facilitates a training on the sustainability mindset for this network. She is the global academic ambassador for Aim to Flourish, the international initiative to promote businesses as agents of world benefit. The prizes are an international showcase of entrepreneurial innovation working toward what needs to be our global agenda, the 17 sustainable development goals. Isabel has worked in North and Latin America, Europe, Asia, and the Middle East. I could go on and on, uh, but no. the, uh, but I will not because time is uh, slipping by, and I know that you've all logged on uh, to hear about the sustainability mindset from Isabel. Isabel, it's great to have you with us, and thank you so much for uh, presenting to the sustainability community sustainability curriculum consortium audience today thank you thank you very much Ira. and it was a little bit long that bio yes i should have thought that you would be tempted to read it uh can i share my screen now you should have it there go. can you see it yes let me know if it's visible. Yes. Okay, well, 
Thank you, Ira, and welcome everybody. I have seen a few people signing in from New Zealand, California, and New York, I believe, and a few others. Um, let me just start briefly with four questions that we normally have in our mind. What will this be about? Why is it important? How will it happen in this hour? And so what? What uh, will it mean for me? So what I will do in this uh, session with you will be share some findings about the research where all this concept of the sustainability mindset originated. That was my doctoral work at Columbia University. Uh, I will also present the elements, the core uh, elements of the sustainability mindset who later become, became the foundation of a course to develop that mindset. And I will share a little bit more about LEAP. And why uh, am I doing this? Um, because uh, so much uh, we, uh, so much time we spend every day dealing with what I call the outer landscape of sustainability, what, with what is happening in the world around us in the newspaper. We see it, we see it in our classrooms, we share it with our students. But there is a, another aspect which I call the inner landscape that not sufficient attention is paid to. And that is why I want to share it with you. Uh, how will we go about this? I will share a, a brief story. I will show, show some uh, facts and uh, findings from my study. And uh, we will explore what is the impact and the potential impact of considering this uh, the mindset. And uh, just in case you're wondering, and to get this out of the way, I am originally from Argentina. And my accent is uh, not quite Spanish, because my first language was German. So now we got that out of the way. And uh, so what? Um, the expectation I, I harbor is that at the end of this session, you will be able to connect something of what you have heard with your own work, with your own practice. Normally, when I start a, a session, I like to connect with the audience visually, which is not happening here and also through the questions, understanding and uh, getting some information ahead of a time, what is uh, that they expect to get out. Because that uh, will help me in guide uh, and select what is it that I will be sharing. In this case, it's not, this will not happen. However, I want to invite you to take 30 seconds and write into the chat box, what is one question that you had on your mind as you signed on to this uh, webinar today, because you decided to sign up. So there was something, some question that you had on your mind. The reason that I'm inviting you to this is uh, for, um, has several aspects. On one hand, by you thinking of that question and writing it down, it helps you focus more on what you really want to get out. Many times we just land in a place and we say, oh, I want to be there, but we haven't thought, what is it that I really want to get out? So the clearer you are at the start, the better chances that you get out what you uh, want. The second reason is that we will have some time uh, later during the session where we go back to those questions, and if they have not been answered, to really pick up on those and make sure that they get addressed. Even if it's not inside of the session, I commit to take those questions and send uh, you my comments to them uh, if you um, add your email and your name to the chat box so we know who you are. Okay, so take a couple of seconds and please type into the chat box. What is one question that you had uh, as you approached this session today? And we are not going to read them out loud now, but just it is for the record and for you to be able to find that question. So let me start with a, a brief story. A number of years ago, I was wondering why uh, leaders changed the way their companies was operating 
to pay more attention to the impact on the environment or the community, if no one had asked them to do so. I am talking uh, of leaders that were not CSR leaders, that were not sustainability officers, but just regular leaders in different positions that said, I need to do something. And I was curious because I thought, we don't know what motivates these people. What is it that they know? How is it that they think? Or what were some triggers that led them in that unusual path? And I was thinking that if we could identify some aspects that could be taught or developed, maybe we could be intentional in developing a new generation of leaders that were more sensitive to the impacts of their work, of their decisions on society or on, or on the environment. So that was my, my motivation. And uh, I started, uh, I used this as my, the focus of my doctoral work uh, which was a teacher's college in Columbia University. And interestingly, because it was teacher's college, uh, the focus was on how did they learn, which really um, sent me on a very particular path, which combined pedagogy with content. And I was thinking, uh, and Ira, you mentioned that pedagogy, content, and leadership are the three pillars of, of the, the organization. So that was my question. I wanted to understand why leaders engage in sustainability initiatives. And I was not, uh, I was interested in what they knew, what got them ready. Was it something that they had uh, learned? What something, was it information that they had? Was it a particular background? Or was it also personal experiences? Or was it something related with their values or maybe traumatic experiences that they had had. Obviously, we cannot replicate traumatic experiences, but I was uh, very curious, and this was a qualitative exploratory study, because at that time there was, I couldn't find anything in the literature that had been exploring these aspects. Um, the qualitative exploratory study focused in this case on 16 business leaders that had championed initiatives within their organization that radically changed how the corporation was operating. It was not a one initiative. It was uh, many times multiple initiatives over time, but it was their role to champion it, to push it, to take the first step. Uh, these individuals were at a very high level in the organization. Mostly they were CEOs, presidents, and some kinds of in some cases, they were at VP level or director or even founder. Um, what I found was very interesting. I found uh, aspects uh, that related to the thinking, how they thought. And they thought in what I could uh, cluster as uh, a system thinking. For example, instead of uh, using the um, uh, the, the logic of uh, either or, either planet or profit, they were thinking, you know, we have to find solution, or I had to find solutions that considered a both and logic. We couldn't think of either or anymore. Also, they had a, a, another aspect that belongs to system thinking, which is a sense of interconnectedness, how elements are interconnected and influence each other. At the same time, uh, they included the long-term perspective into their thinking. It was not just about immediate uh, impact and effort uh, or causes and results, but it was also considering the longer term. And uh, they paid attention to a cyclical flow. You know, very much in our economic paradigm, it is about eternal growth, right? Or in uh, how we govern our nations, we always think about growing, 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 growing. However, these individuals at some point said, well, you know, there is about a cyclical flow. There's a life cycle. Things grow, 
mature die off under its rebirth. And how does this apply to our business? There was another aspect that uh, another cluster that I found in the thinking, which I called the innovative. So basically, there were two things that I found. One is that they had a holistic way of uh, thinking that was based not only on information that was uh, logical, rational, quantitative, but also they used information that came through them through intuition, through uh, their emotions, in information that came from, they couldn't account for, where did it came from, they talked about the gut feeling, something that I just felt very deeply, and also they showed versatility, they were, they were very flexible in the way they approached the, the challenges. Obviously, because there were, in many cases, no precedents, they couldn't find uh, history, how others had addressed these challenges. These are very new challenges. So they had to be very flexible and adaptive and say, okay, we have to invent our solutions out of this. There was another aspect that was a little bit more surprising to me, and I called it the dimension of the being. Um, in this dimension of the being, uh, they presented aspects like a sense of oneness with nature. They were very reflective and also very introspective, not only reflective about the problems, but also reflective about themselves. They spent some time uh, in introspective activities, whether it uh, was uh, meditation or walking and thinking or being on their own or going going into nature, and that really was nurturing and expanding their sense of self-awareness. And also I noticed that they had, uh, it was very present for them, the concept of a larger purpose, uh, not necessarily in religious terms. Uh, for example, one of the questions in my questionnaire was, um, did religion, did spirituality play a role for you? And for many of these individuals, spirituality and religion was the same thing. So they would say, no, I'm not a religious person, although I asked for spiritual reasons. They said, no, I'm not a religious person. However, in a way, they connected it with uh, aspects that related with larger purpose. For example, saying, I'm not a religious person. However, I think that I yeah, am here for a greater task or there is something that I need to do, or there is, uh, I want to make a difference. Mindfulness was another aspect that I found and that I put into this cluster, the dimension of being, uh, as these individuals took time to pause and calm down and try to be more intentional and be more in the moment, be more present. They, not had, they didn't have the vocabulary to describe it in those words in all of the cases, but that was the, the term that best accounted for what I found. And also, they um, showed a, a tendency towards collaboration, almost a need. For example, they were saying, these problems are too big, I, I'm not going to solve them. We need to collaborate, we need to be inventive, we need to be creative, and we have to do find solutions together. So once I had uh, these, uh, uh, these findings, I uh, was at a conference and um, presenting the preliminary findings, and one person in the audience says, oh, now that you have these findings, do you know how to develop it? And I said, oh, that's a good question. And uh, that was um, on the back of my mind from the beginning. I wanted to identify something that we would be able to develop, but I didn't know how. So I went back to my study and to the data, and I said, what was, is there, so, are there some clues in this material that can help me figure out how we could develop this? And I the, the realized that there was a sequence and uh, in these uh, individuals. 
they developed awareness of the state of the planet. And as they developed, uh, they had this information of what was happening, they started to uh, ask themselves, how am I contributing to this? So it was not just uh, knowledge of facts or information, but that information became personal. They started to feel uncomfortable as they said, are we contributing to this? Am I? Uh, are we part of who is making this situation worse? Um, so they started to explore the paradigms, but how is it, why are we doing this? Because this is how we do business, but that is not, uh, I cannot stand for those values because now that I see the damage that we're doing, I don't feel good about it. So they started to experience what, what uh, we call a cognitive dissonance between who they thought they are, how they wanted to see themselves showing up in the world, and this new information that showed them a different reality. And the next step automatically came, I need to do something. I need to do something at the shape of, I cannot be the only one seeing this, I need to share it with others. Others need to see also that the, the impact of what we are uh, doing is so serious that we are not bad people. We are not an uh, evil organization. We are a, co a corporation based on sound values from our founder or whoever it was. But we need to do something. So we need to get into action. I need to get into action. I need to do something. So when I found this sequence, I said, so maybe we can use the same sequence to develop a program or a course. So I started um, putting this, uh, the contents into uh, different uh, content uh, clusters. So one was eco-literacy. Uh, I hope you are following my slides, right? Are you all seeing my slides? Ira, are you all seeing my slides? Definitely, yes. Good, Good thank you. Um, it happened to me once that I was by slide 15 and someone said, you all, you still have the, the first slide on the, on the screen. And, okay, so eco-literacy, what does it mean? That uh, we can start by sharing uh, a broad picture of the state of the planet, uh, not necessarily going in depth, but yes, showing the big picture. And by showing uh, the big picture, the, the focus is, um, seeing, well, the, the, com the complexity of our challenge, the many dimensions of our challenges, and also how are we individually contributing to that. So it's, it's like eco-literacy with a personal twist. How am I contributing to this? Then we have the area of systems intelligence. That means um, Developing aspects like balls and the, these balls and logic, the sense of interconnectedness, how, what are the cyclical flows and the long-term view, how this can be brought into the picture. Then we have the aspects of emotional intelligence, which goes deeper into our values, where it is not just, well, I know that I'm contributing, I look at my plastic bottle and a disposable plastic water bottle, and oh, yes, I know that I'm contributing, but how are my values connecting to that? Oh, uh, if I am uh, 20 years old, I don't want to contribute to a uh, landfill in the Pacific Ocean that is twice the size of Texas. Oh, and where is, where is that going? And my, my plastic bottle is contributing to that? Well, I don't want to be that person. So we go deeper into exploring what are our real values and how do we express them through the decisions we are making. Are they expressed or are they not? And that is where this cognitive dissonance come at play, which is a very strong fuel for action. And then we have the aspect, the dimension of the spiritual intelligence with question like, well, what is my purpose? Why am I here taking, for example, talking to students? Why am I sitting here in the this class, why am I taking this class? Why am I coming to, to college or to uh, school? What is it that I want to do? And asking this the why question, maybe three or four times. The first question, the first answer is normally, oh, because I want to get a degree. Second question, why? Because I want to get a good job. A third question, why? Because I want to get good money. Why? Well, because I want to get a house and form a family and uh, 
and uh, say for uh, paid education to my kids and uh, go on vacation and the fourth why or the fifth why why do i want that that's when it gets more trickier because then we go to the deeper level uh, of why are we doing what we are doing and this is a level that normally is not explored yet it is where this cognitive dissonance originates because if what i want is to be happy what i want is uh, to have a healthy life uh, um, be loved how does that connect with my contributions with be, me being stressed out or me uh, going uh, so fast from task to task that I don't have time to reflect of the impact that I'm making. So a lot of questions and new awareness comes out of these uh, deeper questions. And I invite you as I'm talking to write down maybe some keywords uh, that trigger your attention, some sound bites that you may want to come back in the questions if this is resonating with what you're thinking or what you're doing or what you would like to do or what you don't think you should do. And all this is anchored, if you see in the center, in innovative collaborative action. And that is a very important part because the same as I showed you in the previous uh, graph, the, to have action uh, is a catalyst. It's really releasing our anxiety and makes the whole thing less overwhelming. Many times with colleagues we discuss, okay, how much of the dramas of the world should we cha share with our students without overwhelming them and having them all depressed and feeling, oh, what, what can I do? The challenges are so big. So the clue is in getting into action, helping them find what is one area where you can really what is between your area of control or influence where you can make a difference find a small project where you can collaborate with others to make a difference in the, in something that really bothers you about that that is a wonderful way to channel all this anxiety or all this uh, adrenaline that gets pumped up so what i would like to share with you now i know there are a lot of words on this slide but um, what I just wanted to give you is an example how this, in, in the yellow, you will find the, the words that I uh, had shared with you before as some of the elements of the mindset. And here it is, what does it look like when we uh, use them to state our learning outcomes as we design uh, a class? For example, when we talk about both and logic, what is it that we want to do? What we want that students at the end of this session, this course or whatever it is, understand paradox and that they are familiar with complexity so that they can use this both and logic to develop solutions. So when they are in front of a problem, it should be embedded like the intel inside, the both and logic inside so that they can analyze, interpret data and uh, think of solutions with that lens in mind. The second, for example, identify interconnections means we want them to develop a multi-stakeholder perspective in their solution. So it's not just, uh, is this solution good for, for the practitioner, for the patient, uh, for uh, for the health insurance, uh, for the community, but also maybe for the next generation or for nature as a stakeholder. And that is very challenging if we start to screen our solutions with this multi-stakeholder perspective. But on the other hand, should it be a choice, an option? So you see, you will get, uh, I think, Ira, you will be sharing my, my PowerPoint so you have a chance to read it uh, more leisurely, but I just wanted to give you a feel how these uh, elements can be translated into uh, learning goals. For example, in the being side, uh, we would like that the students see themselves as a part of a larger ecosystem, as they recognize laws of nature that govern all that is, and that includes business. 
or analyze problems and develop solutions from within the framework of oneness with nature. Or, for example, a little bit lower down, uh, learn how to slow down so that they incorporate practices of quieting their mind, achieving moments of calmness, where they connect with their more profound values, and they can be more alert also. And those uh, colleagues who are working or including a moment of meditation into their classes, uh, like in Maharashi University, they know how powerful it is and how much higher levels of performance, cognitive performance, this allows. So just a little sample. And uh, here there are some about the creative potential or the inner wisdom. For example, how do we develop, uh, uh, how do we help students access what I call the right brain hemisphere perspective? And I know that uh, we have uh, uh, this right brain, left brain has a lot of controversy. However, there are uh, aspects um, where we get information. Our first uh, input of information comes through our right brain, and that has been demonstrated in people that have had a stroke on the on the left hemisphere. That they got a lot of information. They just didn't know how to decode it, but they had a gut feeling. There's a very interesting uh, book by, I think, Jill Bolt, my stroke of insight. She's a neuroscientist that had a stroke and she was sort of self-experiencing how it was to have a stroke while she was having it. It took her many years to recover, but then she she had a TED talk too and she wrote this very interesting book, My Stroke of Insight, where she describes how she could get information just not through the left hemisphere. So it was not analytic, it was not rational, she could not speak. Uh, but she had a gut feeling and she knew if that person that, for example, was coming into the room felt right or wrong. So, how do we access that knowledge? Because there is a lot of information that we are not trained to pay attention to that. So, we can find uh, activities, for example, uh, working with art. There are some colleagues that uh, take uh, students to a museum and students in business. I say, okay, find a, a painting that appeals to you. And the students are very uncomfortable. I say, well, I, I don't know anything about art and the business uh, person. Well, even so, or even more so, try. And then they come with very interesting uh, results. There are some articles written by people from uh, within our network that I will be happy to share with you about uh, their experience. So, uh, let me get uh, one uh, step further. What happened after after teaching it for over five years, uh, this course, and seeing how powerful this 13-week course was uh, with students in terms of creating a personal transformation, I said, well, there is something in this. I wonder if people in other parts of the world are doing this. and. Uh, if I'm the only one, that's not going to make a big difference. So I decided to uh, share with some colleagues who were interested in learning more what this was and say, you know, I could share with you what I'm doing and you can see if you can adapt it, adopt it, or if you're doing something similar, we can learn from each other. That is when I created this uh, um, network uh, called LEAP as an acronym for leveraging resources, expanding awareness, accelerating change, and partnering, all with the focus of promoting the sustainability mindset. And it was, uh, you know, a, a very weird initiative, and I, we started out with 15 colleagues uh, four years, a little bit over four years ago, but today, as I was sharing with you, we have hit the 85 academics mark. Someone from Egypt just joined a, a few months ago in uh, 75 universities, uh, I believe 35 countries. So it is really picking up uh, in many places, independent on the context and the geography, but uh, uh, faculty are somehow resonating with there is something missing in how we are approaching our students when we talk about sustainability. And it is basically about this being dimension, because 
in, we teach a lot cases, best practices, we, that we are very good at analyzing and uh, finding uh, how we make, uh, how we can uh, be more innovative and address uh, the SDGs with more technology. But in the motivational side, in the deeper change of our paradigm, there is not much done so far. Well, there is a lot being done now, but uh, not sufficient. And I wanted to share with you, this is what, uh, like the vision of the impact. We uh, are academics, we are impacting students as we uh, embed different elements into our courses. These students at the same time uh, engage in projects, some become social entrepreneurs, others transfer it to business when they go to work or when they are working, or also they impact their community because they are naturally inclined to share it with their peers. Um, at the same time, academics are promoting and sharing it through research and publications and conference and the network, and that becomes also reinforcing and expanding the impact. And I have this yellow button of the world is watching because when uh, students engage in community actions that are connected, uh, that is the visible part of the iceberg. We don't know what happens uh, to them in their mindset, but we can see that they are doing something that they hadn't done before. And that is when the world is watching. So uh, also that is where media media pays attention to. And these are multipliers of the mindset in an indirect way. Um, when I was uh, preparing the slide, so I said, oh, let me put a few books. And then I realized that the slide was not big enough to put up all the books that over these past four years, uh, members of this network have been writing, contributing to editing. So there are many more. For example, uh, last year, uh, a colleague in Indonesia started, uh, created the Center for Sustainability Mindset and Corporate Responsibility in the in her business school. So there are a lot of things happening. People are getting awards and. So it really had gained a lot of momentum. In this slide, I just wanted to share with you, but uh, by becoming the prime working group on the sustainability mindset, we really uh, became champion of the, uh, champions of the global goals, the 17 uh, global goals. And that is a wonderful agenda because it provides a very concrete framework where there is room for anyone whatever, it doesn't matter what discipline we are teaching, uh, what college or where, there is, there is something for everybody. Everybody can find where they can make a difference. Obviously, that, as, as I said before, we are not working on the tip of the iceberg. We are working, most of our attention is in the foundation of this, in the thinking that goes uh, behind or underlies the motivation to engage in this. And there are other institutions like the One Planet Education Network. So Rita Global is a new platform to share and um, aim to flourish. Also, it's an initiative that has been a wonderful platform for professors to develop the mindset and help it, help the students get in touch with a different economic model where we can make a difference through business. So let me pause now and uh, maybe Ira, we can go back to the questions and see what are the questions that were posted that I didn't address or some new questions. Um, if I think that we have a little bit of noise there. Um, yeah, hi, Isabel. I, I'm hearing a yeah. little bit of background noise also, and I've asked the chat box a number of times for people to mute their lines, but someone is not being respectful. Okay. Um, the, uh, there were a number of uh, questions that uh, came in uh, earlier and a few since. I would like to share um, I, they're, they're all interrelated, but I think that each one stands on, on its own. Um, so the first question that uh, came in that was uh, posed by one of the attendees, how can we bring sustainability mindset to campus outside of our classrooms and colleagues 
uh, campus culture? Um, um, well, that is very interesting. Um, I think it always takes a champion. Although we um, do change in a collaborative fashion, we always need someone to do the first step and engage others. So, for example, in uh, some places what they have done is they worked with, if there is a green club, a green student club, these are uh, notes that branch into the culture of the institution because they are out there and they have a lot of peer influence where something can be brought to their attention like, well, let's do, uh, why don't we do a, a session, a dialogue where what does this mean for us? How does this connect with our future? So that we allow them to go to uh, uh, inquire into the deeper levels of making meaning. It doesn't, we don't have to do a full course or a complicated syllabus. We can just start launching a more profound question. Why are you doing what you're doing? And ask that question a few times. And maybe while engaging, uh, when engaging, for example, the, the Green Club or the students that are uh, involved in uh, sustainability on campus, it's a nice place. In other cases, uh, for example, I participated when they do, when they show movies and they offer it on campus that they, sometimes through the library, there will be a movie and discussion. And instead of everybody going away, well, let's have a conversation about these movies. I mean, movies, documentaries that are triggering uh, reflection. And then we can say, okay, what are the deeper questions that come up? So that we help students become aware and uh, explore this other landscape. The next question that came in was, uh, how would you explain the relationship between environmental leadership and the sustainability mindset? That is very interesting. And I think it, uh, it depends on um, what is the background of the environmental leaders. I was reading a very interesting book, um, Evern, Evern Dean, Evern Dean. He was a professor, a Canadian professor, and he, he wrote this book, Humankind and Environment. He wrote it in, I think, in the late 70s. So he was reacting to the environmental movement. And the environmental movement started with people that were close to nature. And they had this experience of nature. They said, well, something, we are not paying attention. And they became then dismissed as the tree huggers, you know, save the whales. Uh, that is not uh, the reality. And well, as they tried to make their case, they said, well, let's show how if we uh, find more efficient ways of dealing with our resources, we can have resources for a longer time. And he said, well, the, 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 the sad thing is that as they did this movement to go from a very profound experience that was very personal, very uh, value-based and very holistic, they became rational pragmatists and they said, okay, let me speak your language, whatever the audience is business. No? And your language is, oh, let's be more efficient. If you don't have resources, you will lose money or you will have to pay more on insurance. And a lot of this conversation is still out there. However, what we are not challenging is the paradigm. And that is what uh, this Neil Everden was uh, lamenting, that by doing the switch, we just uh, have, uh, can be tempted into going into the same paradigm that we should be challenging. We should be challenging what is the purpose of business. We should be challenging what does growth mean. We should be challenging what does success mean mean these are the concepts that we need to challenge because they are very ingrained in the unsustainability what are our what is our individual need of competition and what is the downside of competition when we cannot solve these big challenges in a fashion that is not collaborative so when i when i look at environmental leaders uh, sometimes they come from a place 
that has this deeper understanding and the, uh, understand that we have to do a paradigm shift. Sometimes they come just by studying the biology, studying efficiency of nature and trying to translate that into different domains without questioning the paradigm. And that I think is the, the point. When both happens, that's the best result because then it is really transformational change. Well, I, I liked your answer and I would add that um, by paraphrasing the question into what's the relationship between an environmental mindset and the sustainability mindset, uh, obviously envir environment is only one of the dimensions of sustainability and therefore uh, more narrow and not as robust as a sustainability mindset, but that's just, just my opinion. Uh, move yeah. on. Can I add something to that, Ira? Sure. And I think also rethinking what does environment mean? Because many times we use environment as a synonym of natural environment. And then where are we people? Are we not part of nature? Are we separate from nature? That is at the core of our paradigm and the, the economic model where we see ourselves as separate from nature and beyond or on top of it and where we are discovering the hard way that we are not. But just by, by rethinking what is environment and where does environment start? Does it include the people or does it include only animals and uh, plants? So I think that is a nice entry to see the, uh, to challenge our, our mindset. Agreed. I, I will circle back and um, give you the other questions that uh, came in initially. Uh, but since it follows from uh, our ongoing dialogue here, uh, I'll read the latest one to come in, uh, which starts with a comment and ends with uh, a question for you. Changing one's life to be more sustainable is very difficult because most of our daily lives are surrounded by convenient, unsustainable systems. We are also very separated by our environment, including the source of our food, water, building materials, and where our trash goes. How can we as communicators and educators help bridge these gaps and integrate the larger systems that we are a part of into the lives of students and faculty? Oh, I love this question. Each question is like to write a blog. I like them all. Um, I find it very interesting, the choice of words in this uh, in these questions. Because when I think we are separated from the source, I did I go back to this external landscape of sustainability. Yes, we are separated from the source, but we can be uh, connected and very close to the source cognitively, emotionally, through our expanding our awareness. Because one day I asked a, a group of students, what was your experience with nature this morning? And one said, well, I live in Manhattan, so really I didn't have anything. And another said, well, do you have a window? Yes. Oh, could you see a tree outside? Oh, yes, actually I could see a tree. Well, there you have nature. <laughs> and then another woman said, well, actually I bought flowers yesterday, so I had the flowers at home, so I, I didn't. And uh, I said, what about the food? Is food nature? Oh, oh, yes, actually it is, yeah, yes, we don't, yes, yes, now that you say it, it, it it's nature, yeah. Uh, and what about your body? Is it nature? Oh, <laughs> so it, uh, I could see it was almost visible how they were expanding like little curtains that were opening, 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 and they started to see how they were connected to the source because they could be connected through awareness to the source. It is just in our fast pace that we think that we are apart from nature. One day I asked this question in a classroom. I said, uh, tell me one thing that we don't need nature for. And so, uh, oh, of course, there are many ways. Do we need nature for everything? 
no, no, there are some th things we don't need. Okay, give me an example. And some a person raised, showed a cell phone. Oh, this is not nature. And another said, well, wait a moment, isn't that made out of minerals? <laughs> oh, yes, you're right. Oh, yes. Oh, and what about the plastic? Oh, yes, the plastic actually. Oh, and suddenly they were looking around and saying, what? Is it true that we need nature for everything? So the separation from the source is more in in a segmented, fragmented mindset that we are, when we're thoughtless, we just are in automated mode. But when we start to look, we realize that we are very close. So, uh, I think questions, more than answers, questions are a wonderful way to uh, help us make, bring these new levels of awareness. And then, how does it impact what we're doing and what we want to do? Let me, uh, there are a couple of other good questions here. There's one in particular I'd like to hear you answer, uh, and that is, how do we make working with the heart more acceptable and honored within higher ed? Within what? I, I missed the last part. Within, within what? higher education. Oh, okay. Well. In other words, uh, I'll, to yeah. paraphrase what I think the intent there is, you know, uh, there may be those within higher education who would say, uh, this isn't uh, rigorous enough when we're talking about working with the heart. How can we make yeah. that more acceptable, uh, especially in teaching uh, sustainability-related topics? I think uh, we need to be very careful with the word choice because there are some words that automatically will shut up the ears of, uh, uh, we'll just close them up. So when we are in a setting that is uh, very uh, analytical, logical, or technological even, we can, uh, for example, ask questions that are, again, these why questions. Why are we doing that? Or why are you doing, or if we're watching a video, why do you think that that person is doing that? Uh, you know, we, we may be analyzing uh, a case of uh, uh, some uh, entrepreneur that is uh, doing some very interesting things. So why is that person doing it? And why do you think? And just to bring the dimension, the dimension of values, and also to help them think of their own values. Why are they doing what they are doing? And that is a very simple question, but it's very profound. And it also, another way, is uh, to work with the values that are anchoring us in the unsustainability, which is also very powerful, because we all relate to values like achievement or growth or competition. But when we have to think, what are the downsides? What is the cost of that? Because in those values, uh, lies a lot of what is making our uh, challenge in uh, whether it is related to climate uh, change or, or problems uh, with uh, each other. We can see that uh, in this environmental, on this social level, these values are um, promoting our own problems. But they, it's like a fish in the water. We don't notice that we are swimming in the water. So I think there are questions that we can pose and uh, through videos. Uh, one thing that I uh, did once, uh, I said instead of me coming and uh, trying to educate people on sustainability, I asked them, go and find the best video that you would use if you want to educate someone on sustainability. And I knew that I had in the in the classroom, a mix of people that were skeptic, from more skeptic to more sustainable. <laughs> and I said, go find. And you know, that was so powerful because they watched so many more videos that I could have given them. And they came with all this, and then they had to choose which is the one, that, and they got really uh, engaged. And, okay, this is a powerful one. And they were even saying, oh, you know, look at mine. Uh, it was very interesting, and I didn't have to preach anything. I just let it happen. So, and that is where the passion comes. So I never had to say, well, we will focus on the heart. No, we just focus on what matters to us and why we are doing what we are doing. 
And as we begin to wrap up, uh, Isabel, here is uh, one that may take a little bit of thought. Uh, do you think that order matters? Do you think order matters? Uh, the questioner says, I usually start with exploring paradigms and then work on educating them about current sustainability challenges. Um, what's your reaction to that question? Oh, I would like to have a conversation uh, with uh, that person to learn more about, because I'm sure there is a, a logic, something that he has experienced and uh, the power that he has seen or she has seen with that. I would be very curious. Um, I think they are reinforcing, it's not a one, two, three. They are reinforcing and we constantly go back from one to the other because one is feeding into the other and then we go back. So uh, whether we, I, I would like to hear more. I have probably- uh, I have, uh, I've just unmuted uh, the attendee who raised that question. Marcy, if you're still with us, if you'd like to, elaborate on your question, uh, feel free to do so. Um, hi, can you hear me? Yes. Yes, hi. Hi, um, so I teach an intro course to undergraduates and I usually uh, start with um, paradigms, talking about different um, paradigms of nature and I have them reflect on it and then we go into like a science portion of the course. But I do work it back. Um, I constantly go back to what we talked about regarding paradigms when we're talking about the different um, science related topics like the science of climate change and stuff like that. But I'm still struggling still trying to find the right balance between um, getting them to develop, develop awareness of their worldview um, in context of the choices that they're making in terms of their everyday choices and the policies they support. So I saw on your slide that you talk about, um, it looked like the order on your slide was developing awareness of the issues and then kind of exploring paradigms. So I wasn't sure if you found in your research there was one way to do it that was better than another. Well, that sequence really was what, what I <laughs> tried to hang on because that was the first clue that I had. And I said, well, I don't know how to develop a course to create this. Let me see what I can pick up from these individuals. And there might be other ways. In the, in, the, in the study that I did, it always started with facts. And that is because it's our comfort level, you know. We are more happy to listen to facts than to explore our, look ourselves in the mirror. That is a little bit more comfortable. So I started, uh, as these people were looking at facts, they were, uh, they became, um, the question, am I contributing to that? Well, this is really bad. And what you say, we are doing something for that? That came as a discovery. And then it started to become this cognitive dissonance. Well, I really don't like that. Oh, like a, a, a student was looking at his plate. I said, I'm watching all these videos about the uh, industrial uh, production of food. And suddenly I look at my plate and I have this pieces of chicken and I cannot finish my plate. I feel horrible. So what happened? He was very comfortable looking at, oh, you're, you know, this is uh, industry of food production. Oh, too bad. But suddenly it became personal and it stopped him on his tracks. So uh, I think it is uh, maybe an easier way to get in, but I'm curious to hear maybe uh, in another conversation about not to take the time up from, for everybody, but I personally, I would like to hear more about what the reactions are and how effective it is and what other things you have tried out. Thanks for that answer, Isabel. And uh, what I will do, as you suggested earlier, there are still a number of questions uh, that have come in. I have copied them into an email that I will send to you along with the contact information of uh, the folks who registered for the uh, webinar and uh, you committed to following up with people whose questions haven't been answered. Uh, on the slide that you have posted now is your email address. Uh, so folks who are listening in and looking at the video recording can contact you, I want to thank you for um, 
a fascinating presentation today. I really do appreciate it, uh, as well as some of the things you're doing to help us at Sustainability Curriculum Consortium by making your network, uh, your LEAP network, and the Working Group on Sustainability Mindset aware uh, of the Sustainability Curriculum Consortium, and uh, particular thanks for pointing us to other working group leaders within Prime who have stepped forward and offered to do webinars for Sustainability Curriculum Consortium. Uh, that's much appreciated, and I'm sure that our audience looks forward uh, to those upcoming webinars as much as we appreciated your insights uh, today. So uh, with that, Isabel, I'm, uh, I'll give you uh, the final word and then we will uh, uh, sign off. Thank you very much. And I, I look forward to finding more ways to collaborate and to support these wonderful initiatives. And it is like LEAP because we are together leveraging resources, expanding awareness, accelerating change and partnering. So let's do that. And anyone that is interested to, to join this is a working group it's uh, very relaxed you only put in as much as you want or can it's uh, free and uh, it is a very nice network of people really pioneers in their own institution so drop me an email and uh, we take it from there thank you very much and have a good day afternoon evening very good thank you so much, thank you so much.